friend. Welcome. Go ahead and come in and find your seat. We're so happy you're here. Whether you're online watching or you're in person, thank you for showing up. Thank you for worshiping with us. There are two ways you can support Highland right now. First is by sharing this service with a friend online and by giving to our awesome ministries by texting the number on the screen or giving online. We want to connect with you. So we have new connection cards. They're in the seat back in front of you. You can just scan those with your phone and you can let us know you're here, tell us about a prayer request, or let us know if you want to talk to somebody on staff. If you are a first time guest, we're extra happy you're here. We have a gift for you in the lobby. You can find me after um, at that big welcome center and I can give that to you. We have some new members to announce today. Andrea and Roger Glaud, and their kids, Lila, Brady, and Brooks. So we're so happy they're joining our family. Give it up. So if you are new to Highland, you've recently placed membership, or you just want to find out more, we are having a new to Highland lunch at the end of this month, October 31st, following worship in the crossing, which is a room right behind me. So it's a free lunch. We want anyone who wants you to come, just register online um, or that use that QR code. It's also at the front desk as well. Let's see. Special needs um, worship is starting today. And so this is um, something that we're starting. We want to be known for a church that welcomes and loves people with special needs. And we want to make it easier for parents to worship with us as well. So we're providing a class for their children during worship. Also, if you want to volunteer to help serve on a Sunday during worship, check the bulletin online or scan this code. It's also in the back as well if you want to do the after service. So we have two big gatherings happening this week, and so we'll watch a video that tells us more about those. Hey everybody, Kevin Shelby here. Just a couple days ago, I was getting my son Zane ready for school and he looked up at me and he said, Dad, why are you angry? I looked back at him, I said, Zane, I'm not mad. And he said, yes, you are, Dad, you, you look angry. I said, Zane, I, I'm not mad. I, I promise you, there's nothing wrong. And he said, Dad, I think you need to go look in the mirror. You know, that, that made me think, we all need time for reflection. And now, more than ever, on the heels of this pandemic, we need to take time to reflect on our relationships. Because many of us have spent a lot of time together, but not a lot of time connecting. And so I wanna invite you to come to join us for the Creative for Connection weekend, where we're gonna spend that time looking at our relationships, noticing where we've missed each other and finding ways to bridge those gaps back towards healthy, thriving relationships. So join us on October 22nd and 23rd. We wanna make sure that we carve out that time so that we can have the type of relationships that we were designed to have. I'll see you then. Well, it's October, so you know what that means. It's time to get ready for Trunk or Treat. Let's get together. Let's get together. Let's get together. Everybody. Hay rides and train rides, exotic animals and a petting zoo will all be set up and ready for your families to enjoy. We'll have some live music to listen to and some really great food trucks so you can enjoy a delicious snack while you're here. So we need a lot of trunks and we need a lot of candy to pull this off and of course we need you to invite your friends and neighbors to come and join us. Please go to the link below to sign up for your space and get creative and ready to bless each little trunk or treater that comes by your trunk on October the 24th. Can't wait to see you all at Trunk or Treat. Let's get together, let's get together, let's get together like family.
Oh, amen, church. Good morning. Let's stand up together. Lots of great things happening here, and uh, man, God is moving in this place, in uh, the things that we do, but especially in this place, this space right here this morning as we worship Him, as we draw closer to Him together through worship. Let's sing. Oh, church, it's so good to be here, to be alive today. My Savior, Redeemer, He lifted me from the miry clay. Almighty, forever, I'll never be the same since you came in. No, from the everlasting, right here into the world we live. Come on, the Father's only Son. Hallelujah for all you've done. Come on. My Savior, Redeemer, He lifted me from oh, the mighty yeah. grave. Almighty, forever, I'll never be the same since you came in. Lord, you did from the everlasting right here into the world we live the father's only son oh, and you lived and you died and you rose again on high i know you opened the way yes for the world to live again oh hallelujah And you lived, and you died, and you rose again on high. I know you opened the way for the world to live. Oh, and you lived, and you died, and you rose again on high. Hey, and you opened the way for the world to live. You're the one, you're the only one. You're the one, you're the only one. 
I love this verse. So we will praise you right here and now. We will praise you, you right here and now. Bless the hills and rocks cry out. Bless the hills and rocks cry out. Hey, cause you are the holy one. You are the holy one. Yes, you're the one. You're the only one. You're the one. You're the only one. And we're singing the halle, halle, hallelujah. Hallelujah. All the glory is to you. We would bless you as you come in. We would bless you as oh, you come in. Oh, we lift our hands to you, Lord. You are the holy because one. Because you're the one, you're the only one. You're the one, you're the only one. And if we had 10,000 tongues, if we had 10,000 tongues, we would bless you with everyone. We would bless you with hey, everyone. Because you are the holy one. It never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. And it's higher than the mountains that I face. 
and it's stronger than the power of the grave and it's constant in the trial and the change this one thing it remains i know this one thing it remains you love it never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Oh, oh, your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Oh, oh your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love and your love and all. Yes, it overwhelms and satisfies my soul, and I never ever have to be afraid. This one thing I know it remains. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Oh, your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Come on, church. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love, and your love. Here we go. In death, in life, I'm confident and covered by the power of your great love I know that my debt is paid and there's nothing that can separate my heart from your great love sing it all together your love never fails it never gives up it never runs out on me your love never fails it never gives up it never runs out on Come on, basis. Your love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on me. Three more times. Your love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on me. I know your love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on me. One more time. Your love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your love and I know this one thing. I know this one thing. Remain. Amen, church. Amen. Amen. Yes, 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 yes. How lovely are your dwelling places, your Holy Spirit here in us. Oh, how I love to sing your praises. One day with you. When I bow down before you, I am richer than all kings. When I sit at your table, I am free. When I sit your table I am right where I belong in the doorway of my father's house 
us I'm home I'm home in the doorway my father's house I'm home let's pray Lord, you know my heart, and you know my fears, you know my weaknesses, and my sinful ways. You know that I'm prone to wonder and capable of betrayal, and the truth is I know it too. Yet you love me, and you offer me the broken bread of your body and the poured out wine of your blood. And Lord, help me to be loyal to your covenant. Please look past my faults and into the deepest part of my spirit where I love you with all my being. God, please, please continue to see me as you see your son, Jesus, perfect and pure and holy and because of his blood. And God, I just want to say how thankful I am to, um, to be in your presence to be able to sing your praises, to bow down before you, to sit at your table, and to be right where I belong. Lord, I love you. I thank you so much for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. To the table of mercy, prepared with the wine and the bread. All who are hungry and thirsty, come and your souls will be fed. Why don't you come at the Lord's Receive from his nail scarred hands. Eat of the bread of salvation. Come on and drink of the blood of the Lamb. Come to the table of
Come here to me. Come here to me. Listen, you need something from me? I'll make them an offer they can't refuse. But one day, and the day may never come, I'll ask you to do a service for me. And when you do, I expect your loyalty. Do not betray me. Today, I'm going to talk to you about loyalty and betrayal. And if you betray me, well, I'll have to keep you.
don't know if it's the, the mustache or the, the sultry voice, but that is a handsome fella. <laughs> and uh, one that, that you don't want to mess with. Hey, um, we're going to be in Mark 14 today. As, as we're finishing out Mark, we're going to go a little bit out of order. We're going to be in Mark 14 for three weeks. And last week we talked about forgiveness and the connection that Jesus has hardwired into the system, the, the connection between my forgiveness of others and my relationship to God. So we talked about the, the what, that connection, but we only briefly talked about the why. And the why is, of course, that I have been forgiven much by Jesus. And so I want to go a little bit deeper into that this morning and understand the nature and the scope uh, and the amazingness of God's grace. So we're going to be in Mark 14 today, and we're going to start in verse 10. This will be a little bit longer reading, so, so hang with me. Again, this is in the last week of Jesus' life. This is a special meal. This is, happens over a special meal that Jesus shares with his followers, and then we'll go to another scene. We'll jump ahead. This is Mark 14, verse 10. Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to give Jesus up to them. When they heard it, they were delighted, and they promised to give him money. So he started looking for an opportunity to turn him in. And on the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb was sacrificed, the disciples said to Jesus, where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover meal? And he sent two of his disciples, and <clears throat> he said to them, go into the city, and a man carrying a water jar will meet you. Follow him. Wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, the teacher asked, where's my guest room where I can eat the Passover meal with my disciples. And he'll show you a large room upstairs already furnished. Prepare for us there. When the disciples left, they came into the city. They found everything just as he told them, <clears throat> and they prepared the Passover meal. That evening, Jesus arrived with the twelve, and during the meal, Jesus said, I assure you, one of you will betray me, someone eating with me. And deeply sad, and they asked him one by one, it's not me, is it? And Jesus answered, it's one of the twelve, one who's dipping bread with me into this bowl. The Son of Man goes to his death just as it was written about him, but how terrible it is for that person who betrays the Son of Man. It would have been better for him if he'd never been born. And while they were eating, Jesus took bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to them, and he said, take, this is my body. And he took a cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to them and they all drank from it and he said to them, this is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. And I assure you that I won't drink wine again until the day when I drink it in a new way in God's kingdom. And after singing songs of praise, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Jesus said to them, <clears throat> you will all falter in your faithfulness to me. It is written, I will hit the shepherd and the sheep will go off in all directions. Let's jump down to verse 43. Come with me to 43. And suddenly, while Jesus was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, came with a mob carrying swords and clubs. They had been sent by the chief priests, legal experts, and elders. His betrayer had given them a sign. His betrayer had given them a sign. Arrest the man I kiss and take him away under guard. And as soon as he got there, Judas said to Jesus, Rabbi, and then he kissed him. And then they came and they grabbed Jesus and they arrested him. And one of the bystanders drew a sword and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his ear. And Jesus responded, have you come with swords and clubs to arrest me like an outlaw? Day after day I was with you, teaching in the temple, but you didn't arrest me. But let the scripture be fulfilled. And all his disciples left him and ran away. One young man, a disciple, was wearing nothing but a linen cloth, and they grabbed him, but he left the linen cloth behind and ran away naked. Lindsay and I and the boys, we live in this cove that is full of kids. I think there's like 11 kids in our cove. And it's an awesome place to grow up. So the kids are just running like banshees around that cove all day long, living outside. It's a great place to grow up. But there are some other kids from the neighborhood, not in the cove, who sometimes make their way into our cove. It's kind of like a gang rivalry thing, you know? And so <clears throat> they'll sometimes make their way into our cove and play, and those are great kids too. But apparently, 
One day we were outside and Lindsay and I are talking to some of the other parents who are not really paying attention. And apparently one of those boys who's ventured in from another cove starts to get a little rough with my youngest son, Deacon, who's three. Starts to push him around a little bit. And we're not paying attention to that. What gets our attention are the voices of his two older brothers. What we hear is, hey, hey, that's my brother. I said, yeah, that's my brother. You better stop it or else. And we turn around, and this is what we see. His two older brothers have made a wall between him and this boy, and they're standing there shoulder to shoulder with sticks in their hands, (laughs) ready to fight this kid. And I'll tell you, I had two emotions. The the preacher side of me, the 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 turn-the-other-cheek Christian side of me, uh, is embarrassed. And uh, afraid that somebody's watching, afraid that my church is going to hear about this, afraid that the news will get a hold of this. I can see the headlines like, local preacher's kids go Lord of the Flies on Neighborhood Boy. (laughs) And so that part of me is embarrassed. But every other part of me is about as proud as I can be in this moment. And uh, you see, we have this thing in our family. It's called the Brothers Code. And we got this from Marty and Louise Kuntz. Marty and Luis are former missionaries from Africa who raised four incredible boys who are now men, young men, who love each other. Brothers who love each other is something that we're really interested in and also love the Lord. And so one time I asked him, how did you do that? And he said, oh, it, it was the Brothers Code, which was something that they came up with. And it's this. It's love and respect, serve and protect. That's the Brothers Code. Now, they stole that. They stole it from Paul and Ephesians, love and respect, and the police department, serve and protect. And so I felt like it was okay for me to steal it from them. And so uh, in addition to what we asked the boys about what's the most important thing, love God and love neighbor, the other thing we ask them every day is what's the brother's code? It's love and respect, serve and protect. This is what I owe my brother. But I had no idea if any of that was actually like working its way into their brains until that moment when I heard, hey. That's my brother. You better stop it or else. And I may have taken them for ice cream (laughs) after that. I'm not saying I did. I'm saying I may have. All right. Um, How many of you have taken a personality test before? Any of you taken the Myers-Briggs disc profile, something like that? There's another one. It's called the Enneagram. Maybe you've heard of this. And um, like all of those personality things, it's got its limitations. But just so you know, and it's important that you know this about your minister, I'm an Enneagram 6, which means I'm, a, I'm what you call a loyalist. So the highest value in my life, this is the way I'm wired, is loyalty. And so you might, like, you might say I have a godfather complex. I don't think that I am the godfather. I just expect you to treat me like I am. And if you're loyal to me, I'm going to be loyal to you, right? And that's what we're trying to form in our kids as well. Now, here's the thing. You may not be an Enneagram 6. Like, loyalty may not be the most important value to you, but I would guess it is something that you care about. And so, if you go home and you read Mark 14 this afternoon, which I encourage you to do, I encourage you to read Mark 14 a couple times over the next few weeks. Read your Bible. Read Mark 14. What you're going to discover is that the word that occurs most often in Mark 14, other than the words like the or a or an, the word that occurs most is some form of the word betray. He was betrayed, betrayal, betrayer. And so as somebody who cares about loyalty, this jumps out to me. And so what Jesus says as he's sitting around at this meal with his disciples is that I assure you, one of you will betray me someone who's eating with me. And so I think that at this moment, two things probably went through the disciples' mind. The first, because they thought biblically, which is something I want all of us to do, I think the first thing that probably came to their mind was Psalm 41, because it's pretty clear this is a direct fulfillment or quote from Psalm 41 where we read this, even my good friend, the one I trusted, who shared my food, has kicked me with his heel, a betrayer. So Psalm 41 probably comes to mind because they thought biblically. But the second thing that probably came to mind, well, it's pretty obvious it comes to mind because it's this, not me. 
It's not me, is it? They asked, we're told, one by one. Just see him going around the room. Not me, not me, Jesus. It's not me. <clears throat> now, because we know how this story goes, we're pretty sure we know who it is. It's Judas, right? Uh, Judas betrays Jesus and Mark. You know, in Luke's version of the story and in John's version of the story, we're told that Satan enters into um, Judas and incites him to betray Jesus. But Mark's version of the story is not so kind. In Mark's version of the story, Judas, on his own, seeks out the chief priest so that he can betray the one who has called him to be with him. Remember that from Mark 3? He's called to be with Jesus. He leaves Jesus so that he can betray the one who's called him to be with him. And he betrays him. Do you remember this for how much? For 40 pieces of silver. So, let me give you, give you perspective on that. 40 pieces of silver is the amount of money that the owner of an ox would have to pay to someone else if his ox got out and gored to death that person's slave. Think about this. The king of kings and lord of lords is sold for the price of a slave killed by an animal. Think about that for a second. So when Jesus says about Judas that it would be better for the one who betrays me if he had never been born, that proves to be pretty true. Judas is not remembered very kindly by history, is he? Um, one of my favorite books turned 700 years old two weeks ago. Anybody know what that book is? Dante's Inferno. Not actually one of my favorite books, although you probably have it on your bedside table. You probably read it to your kids before bed. It's a great, encouraging word before nodding off to sleep. Okay. Dante's Inferno is a story of this guy who gets a tour into hell. He gets to tour the various levels of hell. You can kind of picture hell like a bullseye. So sins that aren't so bad are on the outside. They're still getting punished, but not so bad. And the further you work your way in, you get worse and worse sin and worse and worse punishment. If you've ever read Dante's Inferno, which I'm not necessarily encouraging, you'll remember that at the center of hell in the bullseye, there's Satan. And Satan has in his hand, for all of eternity, Judas. And he is chewing on Judas for all eternity. Because in Dante's mind, the center of hell is reserved for those who betray. Okay. So again, history does not remember Judas really kindly. And Mark, Mark calls Judas his betrayer. That's how he's labeled, his betrayer. But that's not quite the whole story. And Dante's picture of this scene also isn't, isn't quite the whole story. Because you may remember verse 27. Right when they finish this meal, when Jesus says that one of you is going to betray me, they're, they're kind of wrapping up the meal, cleaning up the dishes. And then Jesus drops this. He says this. You will all falter in your faithfulness to me. It's written, I will hit the shepherd and the sheep will go off in all directions. And so if you go back and you read Mark 14, and we're going to look at those other stories in the next couple of weeks that we skipped this morning, what you find is that this proves to be absolutely true. It's not just Judas who's disloyal, it's everybody. Uh, there's Peter who disowns Jesus. There's the disciples who can't stay awake in the garden just before Jesus is arrested. And then eventually we come to this. <clears throat> Verse 50, and all his disciples left him and ran away. One young man, a disciple, was wearing nothing but a linen cloth. They grabbed him, but he left the linen cloth behind, and he ran away naked. So Mark 14 is not, is not just the story of the betrayal of, Ju of Jesus by Judas. It's the story about how everyone closest to Jesus betrays him. And so, this helps us to think about our own lives a little bit differently. And, and maybe you, you might put the question to yourself like this. What does this teach me about my faith and my behavior and the connection between those two? Let me, let me ask you a question. Let's be honest for a second. How many of you have driven 
too fast at some point. Okay. There's some liars in here. How many of you have lied? Okay, um, let's stick with speeding. All right. How many of you have driven too fast at some point? Here, here's, here's what I would guess. You know, you're driving along the road, and you, you see that 45-mile-an-hour sp- speed limit sign. And the moment as you're pressing on that accelerator that, that your speedometer creeps up over 45 and hits 46, you are probably not overwhelmed by guilt, right? You're really not thinking about it much at all. And I think the reason is because that law <clears throat> is not connected to a person, right? It's just a law that's on the books. It's a law that's on the street sign. But it's not like I've disappointed or betrayed somebody by driving too fast. You know, it's not like I've betrayed the, the President of the United States or something like that by driving too fast. Nobody thinks about that. It's just a, it's just a law And so when I break it, I don't really feel that much conviction about it because it's not connected to a person. Okay, so let me show you how significant of a moment this is, Mark 14, one of the most significant chapters in all of Scripture, I'm convinced. Because Jesus says, as he's he's preparing this meal or sharing this meal with his disciples, he says, this is the blood of the covenant. The blood of the covenant. And when he uses that word, it's a signal to all those disciples that something really significant, something biblical, something that's been anticipated for a long time is happening right here in this moment. What they would have called to mind is this passage in Jeremiah 31, where God anticipates a time when he is going to start a new covenant. He's going to issue a new covenant or enter into a new covenant with his people. And in Luke's version of this story in Mark, he adds that word new. This is the blood of my new covenant. And the difference, okay, the world-changing difference that's happening right here at this moment in Mark 14 between what was and what is now is that previously God related to us through a list of external laws But now, in the New Covenant, this is what we read in Jeremiah, God says, I'll put my instructions within them, and I'll engrave them on their hearts so that I will be their God, and they'll be my people. This is, I mean, it's hard for me to express fully the significance of this moment. I mean, this is world-changing. No longer is God going to relate to us through a list of external laws. He's now going to write his desires on our hearts so that he can be with us, right? There's going to be this switch from laws to closeness with a person, God the Father. All right. So what Jesus is saying in this meal is that right now, This is the time when that world-changing event is happening. No longer can you think about your faith and your behavior as checking off boxes on an external list of laws that you are expected to keep. Now you got to think about your faith and behavior as satisfaction of me or betrayal of me or disloyalty to me. Now, that feels really heavy, doesn't it? Uh, that feels like bad news. Well, let me, let me point out something about the grace of this. Here's the grace of this. For those of you who have something in your life that you have, you have struggled to overcome and you have dealt with for a long time, here's the grace of this. Let's imagine that your grandmother gave you a car when you turned 16. And when your grandmother hands you those keys, she says, come here to me, honey. And she says, I want you to make me a promise that you will never speed. Okay. Now, when your speedometer creeps up to 46, who comes to mind? Granny. And how dare you betray Granny? You, you see the difference? there though like before it's this list of external laws it's this thing on a sign that I don't really care that much about now it is tied up it is yoked to this woman who loves me more than anything in the world and wants what's best for me and suddenly there is a new motivation to do what I thought I could never do I don't want to let this person down and then let me let me tack on to that and this is the sweetest thing about this whole deal okay 
It's important for us to understand the significance of our sin, that our sin isn't just like failure to uphold some laws, that our sin is the betrayal of this person who has done so much for us and loves us so much. And that feels like bad news or that feels like a heavy weight. Like, Eric, you're trying to shame me into being good. No, I'm not trying to shame you into being good because here's the good news. You've got to understand the bad news and how bad it is to really glimpse the glory of the good news. So here's the good news. In the chapter in the Bible that most fully, most completely focuses and tells the story of the betrayal of Jesus, the worst moment of Jesus' life when he is betrayed by the people closest to him. In the same chapter of the Bible that describes that betrayal, Jesus institutes a meal that we take every week. A meal of what? Forgiveness. I mean, how different is Jesus in this from me? Like I said, I've got that Godfather thing. When I feel betrayed, what I don't feel like doing is saying, why don't you come over for dinner I'm going to prepare this meal for you so I can be with you and forgive you. But that's the heart of Jesus. Jesus is not so unlike us that he doesn't feel betrayed. Mark makes that clear. But he's unlike us in this. When he is betrayed, his impulse is to forgive. Look at this. Paul remembers this. This is in 1 Corinthians Paul says this, I received a tradition from the Lord. He's talking about the Lord's Supper, communion, this meal we're about to take. He said, I received a tradition from the Lord, which I also handed on to you on the night on which he was betrayed. The Lord Jesus took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same thing with the cup after they had eaten, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. And every time you drink from it, do this to remember me. Every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you broadcast the death of the Lord until he comes. You you see, go back one slide if you can, there at the beginning, 23. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus gave us the meal we're about to take. Let me say it one more time. On the night he was betrayed, he gave us this meal of forgiveness. Right? He gave us this meal on the night he was betrayed. Praise God. Praise God. And so when I come to take this Lord's Supper, which I want to encourage you to, to grab it if you've got it here. When I come to take this, right? Paul says that what I should do, each individual should test himself or herself and eat from the bread and drink from the cup in that way. You know, here's a moment to ask myself, God, show me the weight, the gravity, the effect of my sin on you. Help me to feel that. Help me to see that clearly for what it is. I desire to be loyal to you. Help me to see the ways I'm not. But as I take this blood, as I take this bread, his body into me, I am forgiven. God says that the point of that new covenant in Jeremiah is so that I could forgive their wrongdoing and never again remember their sins. This is a sweet meal. Let's take it together. God, I give you great praise that your son Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, gave himself for us in response. That he set this table, he he prepared this meal, which we still take 2,000 years later, as a chance for us to come each week and be forgiven again. God, as we drink from his blood, as we take his body into our own, would you convict us of our sin? to show us what we need to be forgiven for. And in the same moment that you convict us, God, may we experience the grace and tenderness of your forgiveness. I pray that in the name of your son, Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Let's take this meal together.
Sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength. And my story isn't over, my story's just begun. And fail, you won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Yeah, fail, you won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Journey is where you are. You never wanted perfect, you just wanted my heart. And the story isn't over if the story isn't good. And failure's never final when the father's in the room. And failure's never final when the father's in the room. Wide, but dare come to life. 